which one is better, what are the differences between the two, and which one you should be using. Today we are going to explore and compare two different services. On one hand, it will be AWS CKS with Fargate and on the other, GKE Autopilot from Google Cloud. Now, why am I comparing those two services? And the reason is relatively simple. Those are the only fully managed Kubernetes services, or at least that's what they claim. Now, before we proceed, let me explain in very easy terms, what does it mean to be fully managed Kubernetes service? The explanation is relatively simple. It means that we do not manage any aspect of our Kubernetes cluster Everything is in the hands of a cloud provider. They are responsible, making sure that we have sufficient number of nodes, that it's always up and running and all those things. We are supposed to select the name of the cluster and the region where it should run. Everything else should be in hands of a cloud provider. Cloud provider should make sure that it is always up and running, that it is highly available, that it has sufficient number of nodes, that the size of the nodes is what we happen to need, that there is networking, that there is storage, everything. So we select the name of the cluster and the region and everything else happening around our cluster is automatically appearing. It's just happening. We are supposed to be responsible for our applications running inside of those clusters and not what those clusters are, what is below them, what is around them, what they are and none of those things. I want somebody else to manage my cluster fully, no exceptions. And the only job I should have is to apply resources inside of those clusters. We are going to compare AWS EKS with Fargate and GKE Autopilot. I already created a video about uh, GKE Autopilot. The link should be somewhere over there. Check it out if you're not familiar with it. I did not create a separate video about EKS with Fargate for a simple reason. It's been around for a while now. However, if you feel like you would benefit from me creating a video dedicated to EKS with Fargate, just let me know, I'll do it. So, the questions I want to answer here is, which one is better, what are the differences between the two, and which one you should be using? We are going to figure that out by comparing the differences and similarities between the two. So let's move on into the practical part. We are going to explore both of them in parallel within 20 minutes or less. We are going to use left terminal for Fargate and right for GKE Autopilot. Let's start by creating a cluster. And for EKS Fargate, we are going to use EKS Cuttle for a simple reason, because uh, doing it manually requires many different steps. And with Terraform, it's uh, less convenient than EKS Cuttle. Still, it should be the same no matter whether you use one or the other. It doesn't really matter. We are about to create a cluster in whatever is the easiest way, because that's not really the subject of this uh, discussion. EKS Cuttle config file we're going to use is this one. And basically, we are defining a cluster config for EKS Cuttle uh, with the name, the region, USC2, and the version of Kubernetes we want to use. One thing you will notice is that we are not defining the node pool. We are not defining the nodes of our cluster, only the name and the region. And one more important thing, and that's Fargate profile. So unlike GKE Autopilot, uh, Fargate is using the normal EKS, but then we create a profile that tells the system which namespaces should be used with Fargate. So we cannot create a fully managed Kubernetes cluster. We can just tell Fargate to use segments, some parts of the cluster to be fully managed. And we are defining what is managed and what is not by selecting the namespaces that should be managed with Fargate. Now, of course, it could be a full cluster, but then we would need to select all the current and the future namespaces we want to use. In this case, we are defining two profiles default that uh, is based on the default cube system and Argo CD namespaces. And then the dev profile, which will be applied to the dev namespace only if it has the labels env equals dev and checks passed, right? Whatever the labels are. And then to create the cluster, we execute TKS, cuttle, create cluster, and then config file will be fargate.yaml. Now this cluster is being created. Now let's turn our attention to GKE Autopilot, right? Unlike Fargate that uh, doesn't have 
a single command that we can use to create full cluster with Fargate profile, what's or not, at least not through AWS CLI. We need to go to third party tools like EKS Cuttle. GCloud has uh, the fully managed version of its cluster autopilot baked into its CLI. So the command is GCloud container clusters uh, create auto. That's a sub command for creating autopilot cluster. And we're going to call it DevOps Toolkit and the region will be US East uh, 1, let's say. And finally, we need to specify the project, which will be project ID, whatever I have in that variable. And now it is creating a cluster. This will take a while. Uh, before we fast forward, let me tell you that all the commands that I'm running, both those that I executed before the session uh, to prepare everything I needed, and during this demo is in uh, GIST, and GIST is in the description. And now, fast forwarding to the end of the process. Let's see who is going to be faster of the two. Oh, it's finally finished. Okay, uh, that was disappointing from AWS side. Uh, GKE Autopilot was created fast. I don't know the exact timing. Uh, I will know that in post-production, but anyways, GK finished it in probably five minutes or something like that, while uh, AWS took probably like 25 minutes or more longer. I'm not sure. Uh, 20 minutes probably, give or take, right? So EKS with Fargate is much, way slower than uh, GK with Autopilot. But that should not matter much, right? You're probably not creating clusters every day and then you're bored to that, waiting for that to finish. Later on, we will see whether AWS keeps being slower when we start uh, deploying pods. We'll get to there. Let's, let's discuss briefly whether what we saw so far is really fully managed by providers or not. In case of Google, uh, we just executed a command and Google took care of everything. And we cannot see the nodes, we cannot manipulate the nodes or networking or this or that. All of those things are managed by Google. If you go to CloudFormation and see what TKS Couple created, we can see that those are all the resources that it created for us. So EKS Couple gives us an illusion of being fully managed by AWS, which is not really true. We would need to create all those things ourselves if you wouldn't have a helper tool like EKS Cuttle. So if you're an EKS Cuttle user, then you can say, hey, this is fully managed by AWS because I do not see those things. I do not need to create those things. But in reality, they're still there. They're managed by you. It's just that CLI, EKS Cuttle CLI is hiding that from you, which is okay. As a user, you can say, hey, I do not care about those things. I will never touch those things. And then it's, somehow fully managed, but not really. But let's say for now that yes, it is fully managed. You will not see the nodes, at least not directly. From simplicity perspective, it really depends whether you're using EKS Cuttle or something else. If you're using Terraform, if you're going through AWS CLI or something else, you would need to create a lot of things. It's not simple. Now with EKS Cuttle, if you're an EKS Cuttle user, then it is as simple, let's say, give or take, as uh, Google Cloud. Except that we have to create that Fargate profile, which has its advantages and disadvantages as well. But we're going to comment on the profile later, probably around the end of the video. Now let's see what we got from the node perspective. So I'm going to execute kubectl get nodes in both terminals kubectl get nodes and we can see that in both cases we got some initial nodes uh, those are the nodes that run system level uh, processes we are not paying for those nodes uh, in either case we are paying only for what our pods consume and of course we are paying for the control plane as well but that's a separate subject I guess now what happens if you want to deploy something like kubectl apply dash dash file name uh, deployment yaml i have some simple demo application here and i'll, I'll do the same thing in uh, google cloud let's see what now happens with the pods kubectl get pods and nodes let's say and kubectl get pods 
and nodes. And we can see that both are pending. And the reason why the pods that we created are pending is because in both cases, the provider needs to create additional nodes to handle that. So we are going to wait until it creates those nodes and then I will explain how it actually really, really works. For now, let's see who will be faster to create the nodes. And we can see that GK already created additional node. Here it is. Soon one of the pods will be running. And soon after that, AWS also created additional nodes. Now, I must stress, we are not paying for those nodes. We are paying for the resources uh, that our applications are consuming, our pods. But soon, both of them will be running. It took more or less the same time for them to create additional capacity for our nodes. So both of them are expanding the cluster to accept new workloads and will be contracting the cluster when workloads are gone. From the user perspective, they seem to be working more or less in the same way. Both of them are creating additional nodes when we deploy additional pods and both of them are destroying those nodes when we remove the pods. So they're contracting and expanding depending on the workload we are having and all that is happening without our intervention. That's how they manage their clusters. So we just need to deploy stuff and AWS and Google will handle the, the infrastructure for that. So that's absolutely awesome. From user perspective, both of them work the same. Now, technically they are different. AWS on one hand is creating new nodes and it is assigning pods to those nodes. So it is basically saying, hey, you want to run a pod? Excellent. I'm going to create this node and I'm going to tell that pod to run inside of that node. I will assign a pod to a specific node. GKE Autopilot, on the other hand, is using node auto provisioning or NAP uh, combined with cluster autoscaler. So Google is not assigning our pods to any specific node. Instead, they're using cluster autoscaler to expand the cluster so that there is sufficient capacity in that cluster. And then Kubernetes Scheduler runs pods in those additional nodes simply because it detected that there is additional capacity. Now I finally have space inside of my cluster to run those pods. From user perspective, the effect is almost the same, but technically Google is much closer to how Kubernetes should be working. It is leveraging Kubernetes through its cluster autoscaler and few additional things while AWS is assigning pods to specific nodes, which might not seem like a big difference, but I suspect that on the long run, Google strategy is better and it will allow it to keep up with the advancements in Kubernetes. While AWS is doing something very proprietary, it is creating its own changes to the scheduler so that scheduler assigns pods to specific nodes instead of simply wherever there is available capacity. But, as I said before, from user perspective, they are more or less the same. Those are the details running in the background that probably do not matter for the majority of people. If our clusters are expanding and contracting to accept new nodes, the question is really what happens with daemon sets and other, let's say, less commonly used resource types. Uh, daemon set, for example, is a Kubernetes resource type that is designed to run on every single node. We use it often for specific purposes, like, for example, collecting logs. Yes, if we want to collect logs from all the pods in our cluster, we need to have a daemon set that will do that, that will run in every single node and collect uh, logs from different pods on that node and ship it somewhere, right? Now, there are many other usages of daemon set, but I'm, I use logging as, as a simple example. Now let's see how do they behave if we want to deploy a daemon set. Are they fully, fully managed and typical Kubernetes cluster or they have restrictions uh, like, hey, you can run this, but you cannot run that. Let's explore that part. I will apply a daemon set definition that I have prepared. So apply file name daemon set. And I will do the same thing in Google Cloud, kubectl apply file name a daemon set. Now let's watch the pods. Watch kubectl get pods and nodes and see what's happening in both cases. Watch kubectl get pods and nodes. In case of AWS, 
simply daemon sets are not supported at all. So you cannot run a daemon set and you probably cannot run a bunch of other things. You need to be limited to deployment and stateful sets usually. Uh, so AWS does not allow you daemon sets. You can see that there are no pods whatsoever and what's or not. Google on the other hand claims that, hey, one of the big differences between us and AWS is that we, you can run anything. You can run, among other things, demo sets. But look at my screen, look at this thing. Theoretically, you could run it, but only if you're lucky. If there is available capacity on the nodes. You can see here that Google does allow demo sets and there are four pods because there are four nodes in this cluster right now, but none of those pods is running. They're all pending. And that might be even worse, right? AWS cannot run demo sets and it does not allow us to run demo sets, period. In case of Google, you can run demo sets, at least you're allowed to run them, but they do not work, or at least they do not work always. It, it really depends on whether you're lucky or no. If the node that uh, runs some other pods has available capacity or no. In my case, right now, here there is no available capacity. so. All my daemon set pods are in the pending state. So the claim from Google that you can run anything you want in your cluster is not really true. It's more like, hey, you can try to run anything you want, but you might not be successful with things that span multiple nodes like daemon sets. So while I was more in favor of Google for creating the cluster because it is really fully managed, I do not need to do anything except to specify the name of the cluster and the region. In case of AWS, that was much more complex. That complexity is obfuscated, uh, made uh, invisible through EKS Cuttle. So AWS is not really fully managed. It's more giving a perception of being fully managed. And it is indeed managing our nodes. Actually, we're going to get to that later because even that is not truly, fully true. But anyways, on the other hand, what I like about AWS is that it is more honest about what you can and cannot do. Hey, you cannot run the sets period and you know how to deal with it. Google is allowing us to run things that realistically shouldn't be running in this type of cluster like you can see here for demo set and there are a bunch of other examples. So AWS is better off with preventing us from doing things that we shouldn't be doing at least when pods are concerned. Now let's go back to the big screen and discuss a bit more about the differences. With Autopilot, Google created a special type of cluster that is truly, fully, completely managed by Google. Fargate, on the other hand, is almost fully managed and it's almost fully managed only if you create the Fargate profile that encompasses all the namespaces. And that's hard to do because namespaces are being created all the time. If I would like to, let's say, deploy Prometheus right now inside of my AWS cluster, I would need to change the profile first to add that namespace if I would like Prometheus to be in a fully managed part of the cluster. But you need to make the decision which parts of your cluster will have nodes that are managed by AWS and which parts of the cluster will have nodes managed by you unless you list absolutely all the namespaces in the Fargate profile. That, however, has advantages and disadvantages. On one hand, if you want a fully managed Kubernetes cluster completely, fully, no exceptions, then Google Cloud is a better choice because it is a fully managed entire cluster. However, you might have use cases where you want AWS to manage parts of your cluster. Now, I'm still confused what would be those use cases. I haven't found them yet. But if you want AWS to manage part of your cluster and then you manage another part of your cluster for whatever reason that might be, then Fargate with DKS is arguably a better option. Actually, it's not that it's a better option. It's the only solution that allows you to have partially fully managed cluster. You still need to manage the resources around that cluster and everything that that means, except the nodes for the pods running in namespaces that are part of the Fargate profile. If you create a cluster with DKS Cuttle, then all those things are mostly abstracted from you, except the profile. Profile is just to me silly, but unless you mix and match, then it makes sense. If you don't mix and match, Fargate profile doesn't really make much sense if you want a fully managed Kubernetes cluster. Nevertheless, 
If you ignore those details, which you might say, hey, they are important or they are not, but if you ignore those details, we can say that somehow both Fargate and Autopilot are fully managed up to a level. Let's say that AWS Fargate is almost fully managed or uh, getting there, while GK Autopilot is really fully managed. There is no need for you to create any additional resources. There is no need to specify which namespaces are fully managed and so on and so forth. Now, there are many similarities, like you cannot SSH into those nodes in either of the solutions. You cannot change uh, kernel parameters in either of the cases. You cannot use daemon set in, in both of the cases, except that Google allows you to create daemon sets, but they will not always work. So for now, I will say daemon sets are out of the question in both cases, at least until Google figures out how to calculate better the combination of my pods plus daemon sets. And so Google might be getting there in the future, but right now I would not recommend anybody running demo sets in Google Autopilot. So from that perspective, both of them are the same, give or take. In case of Google, you need to choose, hey, is this fully managed cluster or is it not fully managed cluster? While in case of AWS, you get the cluster that is both fully managed or more or less fully managed and not fully managed, depending on the namespaces you choose to uh, include into the Fargate profile. Behind the scenes, what probably doesn't matter for much, how they work is very different. AWS is going to create nodes and then assign pods to those nodes, while Google will create additional nodes as a result of cluster auto scaler detecting that there is no sufficient capacity. And Google will not assign pods to specific nodes, but simply Kubernetes scheduler will do that because it will detect, hey, there is a pending pod, there is a new node that has available capacity, why wouldn't I run a pod over there? So from scaling perspective, Google is closer to how Kubernetes is designed to scale. Nevertheless, as a user, you might not care about those things. Those are more technical details in the background, right? Finally, both of them are easy to set up, but only if in case of AWS you use EKS Cuttle. If you use something else, then uh, things become more complicated with AWS. Even with EKS Cuttle, you still need to create that target profile, which makes sense only if you want to mix and match fully managed and not fully managed. If you want it to be fully, fully managed, then EKS profile is kind of silly, but hey. So which one is better? Which one should you use? I am slightly more inclined towards Google Autopilot or GK Autopilot, but the differences are not significant enough for you to change your provider. You, you should make a decision. Do you want a fully managed or more or less man fully managed Kubernetes cluster? And if you do, you will probably not find enough differences to change your provider. If you're already running in Google, you will probably use Autopilot. If you're running in AWS, you will use Fargate. You will not change, you will not switch because the differences are not as significant as they should be in order for you to make the investment to switch from one to another. But if you're running somewhere else like Azure or Alibaba or what's or not, if you're using one of the providers that does not have fully managed Kubernetes cluster and you do want a fully managed Kubernetes cluster, then your only option is really to switch to some other place. And that some other place would be AWS or Google. And if you're indifferent which provider you use, then I would say that there is a tiny, 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 small advantage for autopilot and if you're indifferent where you go go to google i must conclude the video with hey both of those are fine both of those are doing very similar things there is a slight preference towards google but not significant to make you change and i don't like making videos like that i like making videos where i say hey use this do not use that but i cannot do that in this case both of them are uh, similar, let's say. And that's it. Thank you for watching. Remember to subscribe, hit the like button, do all the stuff. And one more thing before you leave, keep sending me your requests in the comments. Most of the videos I'm creating for a while now are a result of you recommending the topic that I should explore. This is one of those. So keep telling me what I should explore next. I cannot guarantee that I will do all of them within a week, but I am going through your comments and I am choosing subjects based on what you recommend me to explore. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time. Cheers.